I can remember, and some of you would have been at the commencement, uh, it was during Judith Shapiro's tenure, uh, and uh, an honorary degree or a uh, Barnard Medal was given to a woman uh, who had been rejected for admission to Barnard in the 1930s, early 1930s, and then went on to quite a distinguished career as an African-American educator. Uh, and that the story was, uh, as Judith told it, and I have no reason to, to question, I just haven't been able to get a hold of it, uh, that the woman came onto the Barnard campus through the gate, uh, and Virginia Shaw, uh, Virginia Gillisley was there greeting incomers, and spotted this woman, and said, who are you? And the would-be student gave her name, and said, I'm sorry, there's been a terrible mistake, We've already admitted the two black students that were taken. I'm sure she used some other term than black by the Negro. Uh, and sent the student back out. Uh, I, was, I heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one of the stories I was going to tell because the woman I knew, and I can't remember exactly when it was, but she was the director of the Schomburg Collection That's in Harlem. Yep. And she came, she told me this herself. Uh -huh. We were sitting at a table in the college parlor, there was some sort of a dinner, and I was seated next to her. And we were talking, and she said that when she came, she walked through the gates, and Dean Gildersleeve was there, and she said to, I can't remember the woman's name, I'm sorry, um, what are you doing yep. here? And suggested that she go to International House, that there was no room for her at Barnard. Mm -hmm. The black students were always asked to live elsewhere, if, well, yes, even no. if at Vivid, which was rare, but to find accommodation yeah. somewhere but, else, not, not Yeah, And there are other stories like that yeah. that I have heard, uh, not only for black students applying or coming to Barnard, but also for Jewish right. students. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and I should have I should have called you rather than trying to chase uh, Judith down. But the, the, so the point I was making is that she fits into a number of different uh, historical narratives that are that are abroad in the land for the middle part of the twentieth uh, century. Nancy, tell us about why someone might possibly venture into this morass. Oh, this this morass. First, I have to remind everyone that we're sitting in Virginia Gildersleeve's dining room, <laughs> so that if you feel a cool breeze, <laughs> <laughs> and also that both of my husband agreed that we would divide tonight's terrain, uh, he will cover everything that happens on Morningside Heights, and I will do questions of biography. Of course, my questions of biography intrude immediately on everything that's going on yeah. at Morningside Heights. And I never, Heights, I but, never hold well, any of those agreements. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah, it doesn't hold too well. Uh, and since, you know, since it's Gildas Lee's uh, dining room, I, I have to just give her, give, give credit right at the outset to uh, the way she faced up to every problem that came her way for four decades without flinching an extraordinary record. This woman was a natural. She was an insider, and her performance was spectacular, as, as she explains to us herself in her <laughs> <laughs> One of the things she put up with amazingly well was Nicholas Murray Butler, who was here for the entire time. She was just about, they opened up. He was here before she was. Uh, he was full of himself, very demanding. Uh, they got along very, very well, which is an amazing achievement on her part because <laughs> the previous dean had been, um, what should we say, cut short in her tenure because she got into some arguments with Nicholas Murray Butler. But with Gildersleeve, she had the good fortune of being Butler's student, his philosophy student, when he was a young professor. And she was fabulous student, so they just got along really well. Another person she really handled very well was Annie Nathan Meyer, who was a trustee forever, for 50 years, and was underfoot. 
Doreen Gildersleeve's tenure here, decade after decade, and in her autobiography, Gildersleeve even comments on this. She says, when she got older, she was pretty difficult, but you have the feeling she was difficult a little bit before that. <laughs> also, and again, Gildersleeve handled it beautifully. They were nice correspondence, one of the few pieces of correspondence that ex exists. Uh, and, oh, well, the last thing I'll mention before I really launch into it is that Gildersleeve established, as Bob said, this wonderful cooperative relationship with the other women's colleges, which was a stroke of genius. She did it. You know, they were all sitting there, they talked to each other, but she organized them in the 1920s into a fighting force the Seven Sisters Conference. No, the Seven Colleges Conference, but we call them the Seven Sisters, which is the greatest brand in women's history. And <laughs> Gildersleeve had the initiative. She did it. So, you know, her accomplishments, as she tells us, really are spectacular. So, with all this, why would a biographer stay away from Gildersleeve? So, I, I'm just going to make six points very briefly, and I'll tell you what they are in advance in case I don't get to them. And the points I'm going to make are based on five interviews done over a period of you know, 25 years. One, of course, is Bob. Bob, interview one. I interviewed myself. I interviewed Bob's former student who was doing magnificent work on Gildersleeve. Uh, how long ago was this? Maybe, whoa, some time back. Uh, uh, she was writing a biography of, of Gildersleeve did, and the college. Yeah, for and her Sydney. PhD dissertation at Columbia. Uh, and it was immensely difficult, but it's tr a truly uh, 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 gifted student, so that helped me a lot. And I interviewed Roz Rosenberg. And at the last American Historians uh, Convention, I heard a wonderful paper by a would-be biographer of Gildersleeve who simply could not do that. Do it, uh, 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 Stephen Turner at the, at the University of South Florida. So I'm going to mention him too. Uh, and uh, these, I think, are the obstacles for a biographer. In case I don't get to all of them, uh, one: the progressives are a problem for historians and for biographers, and Gildersleeve is shaped by the progressive era. She graduates from college in 1899, she becomes dean in 1911, she, the era shapes her, so that's a problem. Two, biographers, uh, potential biographers, have underestimated Gildersleeve's achievements, which are considerable. Uh, three, her papers are very sparse. That is, there are a lot of administrative papers. But in terms of personal papers, uh, this is a handicap for a biographer. Of course, you know, Bob and I have talked about this. Maybe it's an advantage. Yeah, and we don't need to spend an extra 10 years looking at <laughs> private correspondence. But uh, fourth, Obstacle for a biographer is that Gildersleeve is rather a cold fish. Uh, and everyone who has really uh, gotten into her stuff is uh, makes some observation along this line. So I'll come back to that very briefly. Fifth obstacle with Gildersleeve is her reputation for anti Semitism. Anti Semitism. <laughs> That's a good one. Is you know it it is more, I think it's more than a reputation. It's really there, and that is followed up by her uh, track record in anti-Zionism, which is a totally separate thing. But for the biographer, these things come together. That is, first one would be writing about anti-Semitism in college admissions, which is very important. It will sleep, and then about anti-Zionists, and so that might be a problem for a biographer, or not. Everything I'm mentioning might, um, uh, uh, t sometimes things just turn themselves around and turn it into a, an, an advantage. So let me just start off saying one sentence about the progressives and why uh, they're so difficult for historians. 
and, the, and, and the, for the past 20 or 30 years, uh, progressives of all types have, the historians have been dragging them through the mud because of uh, our expectations are foiled. We look at progressive people <coughs> of Gildersleeve's cohort. Uh, we at first liked them very much because they're urban, educated, okay. modern, and so on, uh, and want to make the world a better place just like us. And then historians and biographers find, have figured this out. When you get closer to them, mm -hmm all sorts of uh, uh, handicaps and disabilities <laughs> manifest themselves. So uh, uh, it, it turns out that wherever you turn among the progressives, and I love writing about them, uh, but you run into racism, sexism, classism, imperialism, uh, uh, the eugen their eugenicists, <laughs> their anti-Semites, and they offend our sensibilities. This is not universal, but it happens often enough so that um, uh, it can become a problem for the biographer. Uh, my second point uh, of, uh, about the underestimation of Virginia Gildersleeve's uh, achievements, uh, this, this actually um, was Stephen Turner's point at, at the last history convention. He said, you know, uh, and he was desperately trying to work with this woman. He said, look, uh, at, at the course of her career, she becomes important so young, 34 years old. She holds on to the deanship for four decades. She understands power. She exerts it. But what did she accomplish for women over that period of time? And this is, I think, a question that the, a biographer can answer. There were real solid accomplishments, uh, some of them in the world of public life, uh, and most of them on the Columbia campus. You know? mm -hmm. And outsiders do not understand the Columbia campus. It is a very, very baffling place <laughs> to, uh, uh, if you're writing a biography of somebody uh, uh, who uh, works here, uh, but, but uh, the way Gildersleeve maneuvered through campus politics for those four decades is almost uh, spectacular. I think, uh, one, I'll just, point to one of her many achievements because I'm not going to go to the, uh, to Morningside Heights. Uh, right, okay. One achievement is, uh, her, I, and I think this is her most um, noted achievement, is that uh, she won for uh, uh, women the uh, um, entrance into the graduate schools mm -hmm. of um, law, medicine, Engineering, I think the Journal other graduates. Journalism. The, is there more? Journalism. 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 Okay. Business, for some reason, are known only to it already admitted women, but uh, the, 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 she, the, this was a tremendous, <coughs> tremendous achievement. <coughs> and the way she achieves anything on this campus, uh, 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 it, she, she explains it. It's also remarkable. She calls her tactic working from within or boring from within. <laughs> and uh, she serves on <coughs> university committee. She was on the big university committee, which I think is the committee uh, uh, for university policy. I forgot the name of it. Uh, it's Butler's kitch Kitchen Cabinet and the deans of all schools. She served on this committee and others. And she knew what to do as the only woman on any of these committees for a very long time. Uh, 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 she was extremely uh, cooperative. Uh, she never challenged anyone in the room because she wrote in her autobiography, they just can't take it. Uh, <laughs> and when it came time for her to get something that she wanted herself, she, uh, she, she, she got it. Uh, and her tactics uh, uh, work just spectacularly well. 
uh, so we can come back to her uh, achievements on, on the, the campus. So, and, and some of them are just really interesting. It's Gildersleeve who uh, uh, presided over a committee at Barnard that ended sororities at Barnard between 1912 and 1916. This uh, was a, a great achievement. These were anti-Semitic institutions. She, they ended under her committee uh, soon after she got here. Woodrow Wilson was unable to do this at Princeton. It, it's an almost impossible task. He could not end the eating clubs. The alumni attacked him. He had to run for governor of New Jersey. He couldn't stay <laughs> at Princeton. He was gone in a few years. But Gildersleeve you know, did, did this. We'll come back to the campus. So uh, let me go on with um, uh, the problems of the biographer. Uh, the papers are sca scarce. The personal papers are uh, Ah, oh, they're not there, but the bio the autobiography. Has anybody seen it? I have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's I've read it. Oh. There's nothing. Personal. Oh. Uh, I was going to ask how helpful or not helpful it was to, I, to a biography. I, for an autobiography is the hardest, you know, thing thing to write and she's an image shaper. She's good at publicity. Mm -hmm. I mean she she's she's doing her thing here. And there are little hints of uh, hints for the biographer of places to go. Uh, one thing that caught my attention um, uh, right off the bat was the importance of her father to uh, well, she's connected. She says, "Oh no, our family is not connected. We are professionals." But who's the professional? It's her and her father who are the professionals. And he's quite something. Yeah. Um, he was a state Supreme Court judge who was uh, moved upstairs to the appellate division, very connected. Uh, he was a Civil War officer uh, and was in touch with everyone in, his, in the 150th Regiment of Army Artillery for mm -hmm. Forever, from, it, from the time the regiment was disbanded into the 20th century, he's in touch. And she mentions uh, what she learns from him, how to behave in public life, how to publicize what you're doing, uh, how to get the right amount of attention. Uh, uh, this is important, and what's interesting is that it's not just Gildersleeve who uh, benefits from this sort of relationship, but a lot of other women in public life at, at the same time. I mean, this, this is commonplace among uh, uh, progressive activists of a certain type. The father is in politics, is in law, and for some reason, who knows why, the daughter is the legatee of his expertise. That's what happens with That's Jane Adams. Too, Jane Adams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Florence Kelly, her father is yeah. a congressman. Uh, who's the young woman who campaigns against sorority here? Who becomes? Uh, oh. Betty Kershaw. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, who said that? It, uh, uh, from her, her. Yes. It, from um, in from inner space. <laughs> 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 Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> Small one for Rona Wilk. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Rona. <laughs> I know Fre Frieda Kershaw's <laughs> father is um, dean of the law school at Columbia, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. for Frieda be to become a campus rebel is, uh, you know, it uh, uh, comes naturally to her too. So there is the autobiography, but uh, there again, the biographer could be stumped by the lack of papers. Uh, my point about. Gildersleeve being a cold fish, uh, feel free to ask questions. These two major relationships that she has, which I call to myself the fish and the fox. Uh, there's no <laughs> way I can remember the names of her companions. There is nothing. Uh, and it seems as if either, you know, the papers might have been cleaned up or uh, um, I just, uh, no one who has worked on Gildersleeve really 
has any particular insight into this. And uh, uh, Bob's former graduate student did look into the papers of the two companions, and one just wonders. Uh, 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 the same-sex relationships uh, were prevalent at all the women's colleges. This is not a solitary instance, mm -hmm. uh, and it it uh, uh, is something one the biographer feels uh, uh, she would have to get into. At Bryn Mawr, M. Carey Thomas was very open, astonishingly, astonishingly open about. Uh, 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 different, different relationships and left all her uh, private papers for her biographer to work through um, and it was a totally different uh, a, a totally different uh, 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 situation. So I, I, I sort of sympathize with Gildersleeve's um, uh, uh, a point of view on her cleaning everything up but the, the, uh, the, the biographer is just left. So. Uh, uh, the real handicap that a biographer might face is to deal in the right way with Gildersleeve's reputation for anti-Semitism, uh, which is extraordinarily interesting because it focuses on college admissions. Now, there might be also further evidence in dealing with faculty members or, or so on, but probably not because Gildersleeve has a knack of rising to the occasion when when she has to, when French Boas needed uh, uh, a job, essentially, she was there to provide one. She and Charles can, Beer. Oh, she, yeah, she can rise to the occasion. She sees her opportunities, and she's very good about it. And Zora Neale Hurston, when, you know, she, she can do it. But in college admissions, that's another story. Yes. And this has become such a focal point of our of everyday existence and such a focal point of scholarship. The scholarship on college admissions is breathtaking. It's really, really interesting. And so, uh, of of all the all the subjects, uh, uh, that's one that just a biographer would have to confront that and to deal with it. Uh, the right way, whatever the, the right way is, and Bob can correct me, but as I understand it, the figures that are given out is that Barnard was, uh, uh, had a 20% Jewish student body in the years between the war, so World War I to World War II, uh, that's what it was, that this was uh, uh, a far larger percentage than at any of the other women's colleges, where it uh, w would might have six, six, seven, ten percent uh, 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 of it, of its population, student population, uh, uh, Jewish. But uh, there was no pressure on many of these institutions. There was a lot of pressure on Barnard uh, uh, to uh, change its ed admission policies and uh, the situation is extremely complex because Barnard and Columbia worked together on student admissions for this entire early period. Um, uh, 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 I think I have it right, Bob, but feel free to jump in. Co uh, Columbia was the first college to establish an admissions office for undergraduates and that included Barnard, Columbia, uh, engineering, Columbia set the policy uh, for admissions, mm -hmm. but the actual admissions of Barnard students seems to have been done over here by Gildersleeve yes. with one professor she worked with who uh, also served as the head of Columbia's admission policy uh, uh, co committee, and, and his name was Jones, so it was Gildersleeve and Jones uh, who did admissions <laughs> together, sometimes another faculty member or two would join them. Uh, the, uh, uh, they did just the Barnard side, side of it. They met uh, at regular intervals known only to Gildersleeve. She seemed to have some sort of rolling admissions policy. 
that whenever they met, more people were admitted to the next class. Uh, but the data that the admissions office uh, left behind for all of the Gildersleeve years are quite, quite, quite impressive. Uh, Gildersleeve and Jones did not comment on their work, and in other universities there's much, much and including Columbia, there's much more commentary on admissions policy. Uh, they just did it. And uh, the quota that Columbia set, uh, and let's not, not call it a quota, let's say the uppermost, the 20% uppermost level, wouldn't that be the... Mm -hmm. the, that's a quota. the yeah, of course, that's a quota. <laughs> the uppermost level. Uh, 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 Gildersleeve, uh, who always did her job perfectly, exceeded uh, the, the quota. That is, she had her own more severe quota that she stuck to. That was quite low for those interwar years. I spot checked two classes for the 1920s, and uh, it was uh, more like t she, she imposed on herself and Jones a 10% quote, and they, they stuck to it. So this was some severe admissions policy. And of course, Gildersleeve's motive in doing all of this was that she was competing with the other of the seven sisters, and uh, uh, she was going to uphold uh, Barnard's place in uh, that firmament. And also, uh, if Columbia had a rule, she was uh, not only going to adhere to it, but more than adhere to it. So there was a very interesting situation there. Uh, and uh, the, the whole area is, is very interesting comparatively, because you can compare what uh, the literature is so rich, you can compare what went on at How one can place you tell who's a place. Jew when you, when you look at those um, statistics? Oh, you can't tell. You can't tell. Uh, but you can make a rough en estimate. So I made a rough estimate. I figured if I was <coughs> undercounting or overcounting, I was doing the same for both the admitted students and the rejected students. Mm -hmm. I'm only and asking because yes, be um, you know, doing my part of the Barnard and the suffrage movement, there are a lot of German names. Oh so you, yes. So you don't know who's there's there's some. And Jews. You would some Jews some, are German. Yes. I mean, some Germans are Jews and some aren't. I know. You have to make just a, a <laughs> guess and hope that uh, it, it well, you're winds doing, up. You're, you're doing the same thing that those three admissions officers were doing, too. Mm -hmm. Right. They were making guesses. Exactly. The, well, but they had more information. No, they, did, they no, didn't? They didn't really. Uh, well, they had a little more information. Addresses? The, 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 yes. The, the standard form did have, did. Uh, ask you a, a couple of questions that could could lead into um, determining it, but um, there are a couple of spots in the record where you, you get a little closer to to things. Uh, the entering class in 1906 gets reviewed by the by the registrar, uh, and <laughs> her comment is that the place is going to see. <laughs> uh, there are too many people who are coming from places we've never heard of and that the trustees have never stepped foot in. Uh, and she ticks off the names. Really? And then it's possible to take them into the yearbooks and see if they join or ask mm -hmm. to pledge a fraternity because the fraternities aren't eliminated until 1914. So if you take that class of 1910 and if somebody has a tick and is not in a fraternity and has one of those ambiguous <laughs> names uh, for a maiden name and then an ambiguous name of a uh, husband, possibly Jewish, you, possibly you, Jewish. You, that's, that's how you would go about, about doing it. And, but the 20%, I, I, I resist the term quota because Butler was very careful. Yes. Uh, because the. Lowell at Harvard had just sort of stepped into it by talking about a quarter so straightforwardly. Um, 
they, they had a target size class, that was what they were aiming for, and then within, that, within that class they had certain uh, expectations, and uh, that's how they played out. But it was your research that got me thinking, one of the, there were three categories that yes. they used yes. uh, when they looked at an application. Um, it, um, admitted on the basis of examinations, that, that is the regents exam or the college boards or whatever, they, those are the two principal ones. Admitted uh, without? Condition. Condition. Yeah. Then there was condition. Mm. And there's, there's the barn door. <laughs> because <laughs> the condition was, could be, you know, that they missed one, one subject they were a little short on or a whole slew of subjects. And, and then, it, then there was the third rejection. So what I think, and pretty clearly happening at Columbia, is you did not find Jews being admitted in that with condition situation. Never. Mm -hmm. um, some of them got accepted, and m many of them got rejected. But that's if there right. was a condition attached, they were rejected. OK, that's, that's yeah. exactly what and, happened yeah. in the Jones I looked the, at here. The Jones you talked about. Jones, I, I keep a, com yeah. Confuse him with... Uh, <coughs> Jones's wife is a Barnard graduate, and she becomes a trustee in the late 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a pretty close connection. Uh, but jo Jones's successor does give some numbers that, that we can use for the mid-30s, and you know, the numbers yes. they're using. Barnard yes. is tracking Columbia's pattern, but I think pretty precisely. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. May I? I've said it before, but I want to say it again. There are Jews and there are Jews. So well, they have, well, we haven't, said right. any, we haven't said anything that yeah. no, face. No, but that's when, very, when, very when very you're important. looking at that's, Jews, right. um, I just think it's important, particularly here, and not because of Annie, um, because some of the people I've turned up are like the Lewis and sisters I was talking mm -hmm. about. Um, what, they rode in suffrage parades, and, and one of them founded the Henry Street um, Theater. One, yes. Adele was, was a Barnard. Grad. Um, okay, you're, you're so there's a class of oh, yeah. German, oh. rich German Jews, oh, well, mm -hmm. that and there are proud. the Lower East Side poor yeah. Jews. Yes. yes, this is a very important distinction and for the, the, the only reason I'm saying it oh, is no. that every time you say Jews, no, I no, say no, rich no. Jews, right. because I, I assume out. some of this is about I rich left Jews. out at that. <laughs> very, it's a, of course a very important point, and that's that all, I mean that's to all say. Leave it, leave it out. Uh, Gildersleeve uh, does not want the East European whore here. Right, right, right. She just does not, and she neither writes does about Annie. this. Neither to does Annie. 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 She writes. Oh, neither does Annie. Right. But, well, so but the correspondence between them, Gildersleeve writes to Annie and expresses this very <laughs> thought. Uh, in very clear-cut language, and this is one of the few really interesting letters of Gildersleeves that exists, and it doesn't exist at Barnard or Columbia. It exists in the American Jewish Archive. I've seen and it. I've seen it. Okay. I've seen it. <laughs> From Gildersleeve calls Jews a race, and Annie um, contests that, and so Gildersleeve backs down and yeah. apologizes. Uh, <laughs> I've read she those. also <laughs> referred. I have a story too of a student who came under her t tenure here, and she referred to this student as your kind we can sure. take. Sure, and at Columbia they would say, refer to it as those fellows and our fellows. We really but you know, that was fellows. not uncommon at the time. In the Ivies, in the Everywhere. Sisters, okay. it was it, the, well, that idea of uh, limited admissions. That's why the totally. literature is, is so in interesting. Uh, uh, there's so, sorry to interrupt. It just seems to change the question for me. Uh, and what, what way does it change? That we're talking about class and not religion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, uh, it, well, this is, I, or are we? I don't well, know. I, I, I don't know. It's, I think a, it combination. Comes, it's yeah. a combination. It's a combination. In the absolutely. in the Columbia case, I think it tends the distinction that you're making is one that certain trustees are reluctant to make. Hmm. Um, that uh, what the Jewish characteristic that they would attribute that would cross the class line would be materialistic. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. and clubbish uh, to e e exclusively uh, among themselves. That I could find in in Columbia trustee mm -hmm. actions. Mm -hmm. Yes, and sir. The re and the resistance of Columbia for 40 years to admitting into their sacred trustee dome any, any Jews at all. Mm -hmm. And the names of those Jews that were being proposed to them are gilt-edged German They're Jews, the Lehmans, the Oxes, right. the, right. Uh, right. Jacob Schiff spends an immense amount of time either lobbying for himself or I think he was equally, would have been equally content just about any right. one of his, uh, yeah. his friends. And, and Columbia resisted. On the Barnard side, I mean, it's always good to have Columbia as a comparison <laughs> here in these things. On the, on the Barnard side, the presence of Schiff on the original board and the involvement of a number of German Jewish families as contributors to Barnard uh, mm -hmm. does yeah. suggest that um, Barnard, at least institutionally and probably guiltlessly personally, did make that distinction, mm -hmm. but it. Uh, I think so. But it, if if anything, it made her even harder, to my mind, on uh, the Jewish applicant who was not of the R crowd. Crowd, mm -hmm. uh, and she could be she could be dismissive in a way that I think uh, would have even shamed. Uh, uh, Dean McKnight over at Columbia College, who was you know, sort of interviewed people and looked them up and down and said, "I think you're a good material for City College," right. Right. or you might try you might try Seth Lowe Junior College over Brooklyn mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something of that sort. Um, that uh, she she is reported to have done that with a economics professor, P new PhD, Moses Abramowitz who Eli Ginsburg says was sent over to Barnard to fill a spot, and she just caught him at the door, turned him around, mm -hmm. and sent him back. Mm -hmm. but that's and a, he had to settle to go to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Russian Jew. Uh, yes, and there was some question of whether, whether, whether the wits was a V or a W here, and <laughs> that's right. it was going to matter in that's some, right. in some yeah, fashion. Absolutely. So there's, there are different stories uh, about it. One interesting thing about Barnard is that the Gildersleeve and, and Jones uh, just ran a, a quite clean ship here. Uh, um, one can anal analyze their data, but they did, didn't leave this track record of commentary that was left at, at Columbia and, and, and at, 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 the, at the big men's colleges, at, at Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Uh, these, these places uh, 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 have come under historian scrutiny, and the correspondence is vast and, and marvelous uh, uh, about whom to admit and whom not to admit. Uh, Gildersleeve and, and Jones uh, uh, were quite stingy uh, in the commentary. They yeah. did not believe quite enough yeah. to... Uh, 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 go with, whereas over at Columbia, the trustees seem to be writing to each other and yeah. commenting at, at all, all the time. Uh, and uh, uh, there's, there's one marvelous book by a sociologist at Berkeley called uh, James Carabell, who uh, uh, just walks through the archives at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and data of marvelous sorts falls down on him, <laughs> and he records all these extraordinary quotes that the dean of admissions wrote to the ex-dean of admissions, and so forth and so on. Um, uh, not, not at Barnard, no. And, but in the, in the case of Princeton, it was so uh, up on the surface because uh, alums worried that Princeton was going to introduce more and more Jewish students, because I saw one the other day, kind of thing. And the alumni magazine is filled with annual reports giving the breakdown of the percentage of, mm. of mm. Catholics, Jews, mm. Protestants, Protestants broken into different different categories below. And it's meant to reassure the trustees that yes. uh, all is yeah. all is well, all is well at, yeah. at, at, at Princeton. Mm -hmm. uh, Yale did some of the same mm -hmm. thing. So it was, to them it was 
uh, something that needed to be uh, put made explicit, and not so not so here. Um, other Philip. Now, um, Nancy, I believe you prefaced by saying we're dealing with between the wars. Well, 1920 yes. to 1940? Yes. Yeah. And so my, my question yes, is, that's the, uh, what happened in 40 to 45? Because this is the last few years of, of, of uh, Gildersleeve's uh, um, tenure. That is fair. And the reason I ask is in 1990, I had the pleasure of being the faculty uh, lecturer on a tour to the Galapagos that actually uh, combined us with a couple of other schools as well. Uh, and there were 24 Barnard people there, and that included the husband, so there was maybe uh, 15 Barnard people. And who the people who go on these tours were generally retired people. So these were people who had graduated as early as 1945. Mm -hmm. So there was a woman, a Dutch woman with her daughter, who had escaped uh, what was happening in Europe, and mm -hmm. Cummin was a student, and she's now back to take our tour. But there was another woman who had graduated in 45, and one of the first things she said to me as we're climbing lava rocks and <laughs> looking at the garden <laughs> is that she was very aware of the anti-Semitism when she was a student here. So it was more than just getting in, it was also sort of, we'd, we'd mentioned yeah. a bit of the feeling when they were here. Yeah. And but so I was curious, both not only of that, but also, was there a change during the war? When no, I don't think it's, I don't think the war. Uh, speaking of both places, yes. I don't think it's the war that changed it. It's the immediate aftermath of the war, and it's yeah. it's mm -hmm. uh, in part clear understanding of what the final solution was. Mm -hmm. It must have moved some people, mm -hmm. but there was state legislation that came out of the war that uh, challenged a place like Columbia that put its charter in doubt because mm -hmm. its charter was non-denominational. You know, there'd be no restrictions. And there were enough charges and enough Jewish organizations that were ready to make these charges uh, that Columbia was in serious trouble mm -hmm. uh, at that point. And that's when I think uh, Nicholas Murray Butler ordered uh, clearing out of the archives. Mm -hmm. The only evidence we find of mm. anti-Semitism is in the trustees, <laughs> not, in, not in Butler's papers, as far as I can tell. So that he, huh. he, he set a graduate student to clearing, clearing out. Vacuum. The <laughs> well, maybe that, maybe yeah. that, that, and, that and, 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 and what happened in 47, it was, I mean, it's a great New York story, I think, it that the Columbia and Cornell was involved, a little bit involved in it, but the target was Columbia, no question about that. Mm -hmm. And the way it worked out was that the Columbia lobbyists got a hold of the Catholic lobbyists who were representing a lot of colleges in New York State, and they both agreed that if they could keep this anti-discrimination charge to a minimum, that they would work together. And they came up with a proposal that they would no longer oppose the State University of New York. That was the, that was the compromise. <laughs> and the State University of New York then, at that point, be, achieves the capacity to become something, become something more than a series of normal schools you know, up in Skinia, up in Oneonta, and that sort of thing, and become what Rockefeller makes it mm -hmm. in the in the 60s. Uh, it was a close call. Uh, Columbia never admitted to uh, having been discriminatory, mm -hmm. but the the evidence of, of it is. When did Lionel Trilling come? Lionel Trilling came in 1924. No, I mean as a as a, as a professor, yeah. 1936. Yeah, because he's the first Jewish. Professor. No, he's not. He's, he's not. Who's not? There were a couple. No, of there four. there is uh, there uh, Temple Emmanuel uh, funded a, um, a professorship that was went to a uh, Jew who was the rabbi there in the 1890s, uh, and then oh. there was a German uh, there was a Jewish history Saul Baron. Uh, mm -hmm. In the 1930s, famous one, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Franz Boas was Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what Trilling is 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 uh, the most noted one, and you know writes the most elegantly mm -hmm. about it. Uh, but, but he's also East European. He's uh, yeah, he's done yeah, yeah. And then that, and and in, and his description of it, and then in. in uh, his wife's description of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the real moment it comes 
when they can get into the English department, someone whose name is Sholem something or other, that it's mm -hmm. a very, you know, because Lionel sounds, Mm -hmm. You know, we would never, yes. have, we would never have hit him with a tick. No, that's what I mean. No, <laughs> he would have, he would have eluded our tick. Hey, and if you talk to him, that, that was go. another reason you would never. No, have I bought the propaganda. I just assumed he was the first no. serious faculty. <coughs> no, and in that sense, you have to give, you have to give. Um, this may play to your point about a distinction that I'm, no, I'm ready to to concede to uh, Gillisley. She was responsible for the appointment of Julius Hill and of uh, Marguerite Beaver, who was a, at the time an even more important archaeologist, art historian. And they both <coughs> were part of the, you know, the, the exodus out of, uh, out of Europe in the, in when, when uh, Hitler took power. Um, and she found places for both of them here, where Columbia did very little uh, in the 30s, uh, to find places for uh, German immigrants who were, you know, kicked out of their positions mm -hmm. in Europe. So, in that, in that one instance, uh, Virginia can go up pretty well. She can rise to the occasion. Yeah, but again, it fits your pattern. This is not, you know, this is not Abramowitz from the Bronx. This right. is uh, right. Margaret Beaver with a PhD from, uh, uh, you know, Gutenberg and, and a chaired position at a university, and it was only Hitler who drew her out. Right. And, and well, it was only Hitler who made Annie aware that she was a Jew. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> so I guess there was some reckoning. Can I ask an, earl an earlier, um, I don't know how you're going to divide this, but um, I, I'd be curious to know about the First World War, Virginia and her relationship to the First World War. Um, because in my work, I never, I have now learned about the uh, opposition to the war, mostly among these suffragists, mm -hmm. who are also pacifists. And here on the Columbia campus, um, that's why Boaz had to come to Barnard. Um, well, what, was Virginia, what was Virginia Gildersleeve's well, she, politics? So, and she, welcomed, she welcomed him. She was not deterred yeah. What about the war, though? She, she, she took a position about two steps away from Nicholas Murray Butler. But, Butler in the early... Preparedness. In, in, no, but, no, Butler early on, between 1914, beginning of the war, and 1970, Butler was one of the slowest of the academics to move into interventionism. Um, he, he resisted uh, bringing the Plattsburgh movement down here, which was, mm -hmm. you know, people marching around on South Campus. Um, he, yes. Yes. he only in the spring of 1917 got religion on the war, and like a con, like a you know, convert, convert uh, he then within weeks told the faculty they had to be and in, fired in a position. People and I, but but for being he, against it, yeah. Uh, well, the trustees formally did the firing, mm -hmm. but uh, for reasons that that they could distinguish uh, from their war positions. Uh, in the case of Cattell, mm -hmm. he, he violated the law, mm -hmm. uh, and he also used Columbia Stationery for, for certain yes. things. Yeah, but, but Gillisleeve, again, comparatively <laughs> comes she? out well, because yes, she, she, does. she does harbor Boaz, and there is another per one of the people fired, one of the few people, who was an economist here, David Muzzy, and she oh. regrets his leaving, where the Columbia people sort of gave him a bum's rush. Mm -hmm. And then she goes out of her way to say nice things about Charles Beard. Mm -hmm. Now, Beard supported the war, but was angry at the trustees for, the, for coming it's down yeah. hard on people. Yeah. And, but she, she, she didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Butler, Butler privately was not as angry with Beard as the trustees were. But she was more upfront. Mm -hmm. uh, that was impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, but she she got she became an enthusiastic. Uh, uh, she mobilized during the war, mm -hmm. and then I think that's where she got interested in international stuff. Mm -hmm. And then in the Second World War, she was there. She was there right at the outset, which was also true. Oh, but. Your uh, Annie Nathan Meyer became a flag waver for the war, yeah, and for limiting immigration. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, why, that's why the progressives is such fun. Well, she does. She was an anti. Yeah. Yeah. She was an anti. Yeah, that's, that's a bad. Well, her sister yeah. is marching in a peace parade. Yeah. 
uh, would we, uh, it's at the end of Butler's and Gildersleeve's career, this really goes back to Phil's question, that Gildersleeve uh, at career at, on Morningside Heights, that Gildersleeve has the opportunity to throw herself into international affairs more or less full time. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, her, her anti-Zionism had actually started during uh, the World War I era. That's when she first uh, um, started voicing it, but she comes back to it after her retirement from uh, a Barnard um, of big time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, she is um, uh, the, the head of a big committee that's um, uh, uh, way up front there with, with uh, uh, one of the Roosevelts, I forgot which one, Kermit, uh, and uh, uh, she attacks the, uh, she's the first one to attack the pro-Zionist media uh, in the United States, uh, she gets a lot of attention uh, for this. Uh, she's sort of way ahead of her time mm -hmm. and, and, uh, in, in these, these arguments. So that, that part is uh, re really in interesting. And it all reflects a sort of global reach that she had mm -hmm. throughout her presidency. She, she's re genuinely interested in what's happening elsewhere. Uh, so there's a combination of mm. things she must going she on must have gone really. she had frequent flyer miles yes, on the <laughs> Kuna lines <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, she went every summer I mean she just again it's it's oh. like uh, well that's what it's like Spurgeon it's, it's like Butler it was that she would go <laughs> for the summer Carolyn Spurgeon would come here for a semester right. um, and teach here and then whenever a sabbatical came up they would go or whenever Virginia Gillespie got sick, and she was sick a lot. Um, uh, the, the, the recuperation would take place in England. They had a, a, a home there. What was she sick with? Uh, I don't know. Tired, you know, exhaustion, sorts of things. I don't know whether it was anything more, you know, so medically diagnosed. Really I have one bone yeah. to pick, though, because it does play into this. You uh, and others have, and it's absolutely correct, have Virginia Gillespie taking a role in the elimination of fraternities at sororities at uh, Barnard? She is there, but my sense is she was not in favor of eliminating them. Um, she was herself a yeah. proud member of Kappa Kappa Gamma, yeah. which was the yeah. uh, organization that uh, prompted um, a in an instance of what appears to be anti-Semitism okay. prompted the growth of a second sorority that uh, uh, Rona has spoken about. But even when she's dean, there is, and I, Harold actually just sent me yes, some yes. of this the other yes. day, when she's dean, there is a uh, committee that she puts together uh, that uh, is to decide on this issue or recommend something well, for the entire the faculty. Part. She gives it to the committee to, to do. <laughs> Ex extraordinary. Yeah, oh, no. So she's very clever. Very clever. <laughs> but the committee does give a majority and a minority report. And the majority report is identified as being what she wanted. And the majority report did not eliminate the, trust, the sororities of fraternities. It uh, made it call for greater transparency on them, and the minority report was the report by William Tenney Brewster, who was the provost, member of the English department, provost, which was a university assigned position, and he was the person that Butler thought he was going to have deaning Barnard. Yes, that's um, right. Mm -hmm. And he he comes over as an interesting guy to me because he he early on. Poo poos the whole notion of Barnard being a country college. She said, "That's crazy. You know, we're not a country college, and and we're not going to get those rich young women who are going off to Bryn Mawr and to Wellesley. We're, we're so serving the city. Right. I know it's a, uh -huh. a, a quite different view. I don't think Virginia Gillespie, in all the years she was dean, ever recognized that position as legitimate." That is hmm. the, the probe. Yes, yeah. the outside probe. No, well, no, you know, no, 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 that Barnard was a New York institution. Yeah. Oh. She is, she is a New York to the nines, no question about that. But it's old New York 
Uh, it's yes. pre-immigration New York. Mm -hmm. She makes she makes a crack in in the autobiography that I'm sure she meant as positive and sort of chuck chuck oh, yes. to Alice Smith about the Irish. Mm -hmm. She has no yeah. problem with the Irish, and Barnett had no problem with. Mm -hmm. it would, yeah. Certainly, we're not discriminating against Irish or any other uh, group of Catholics. Uh, but she said. It was strange, in, in, into my 40s, before I realized that this brilliant race had anything other than the people back in the kitchen who were cleaning, cleaning up. Didn't she see the cops? Uh, so it was, it, it, she, anyway. yeah. she, I, I think she deluded herself uh, all the way through, uh, denying that Barnard was fundamentally different from the other sisters, and that it her is. her coup, her yeah. great that, coup, was convincing <laughs> those other right. sisters that Barnard was a sister. Uh, well, that's true. We, we had that. had none of the money, that's that's true. Uh, none that's of the right. acreage, yes. uh, none of the right. legacies, uh, and she just she just right. did it. Right. And right. and what happened to Goucher? Right. And what happened to Wells? Those right. were colleges that were in the in the same she sort of circles. She <laughs> put it together and then she clamped it down. That's it. You know, we're not, it's not going to get any bigger. This is the seven. We're going to go with it. And what happened to the seven sisters? She talked about it as being for fundraising purposes. Mm. And well, it was she, a terrific brand. She yeah, was, but she, they didn't raise a cent. <laughs> <laughs> because well. it, Chris would know this. <laughs> Why would Wellesley hand Barnard <laughs> its list of donors <laughs> to split oh, right, up. Right, no. yeah, so uh, Barnett came to the table with uh, nothing but membership. Wellesley came to the table and kept its 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 list to to itself. And so they they were, there was very little actually accomplished by the seven sisters. Well, no, no, no. That right. persisted through my time. I know it did. And what happened? Uh, by the time it was over, it was five sisters. Right. But. Um, it was to promote women's education, and it was basically an admissions group that went out to talk. We usually went to. to oh, all right. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Uh, I mean, okay. that, that's yeah. what it became. So, so, so the, somebody from Barnard might go out and be talking on behalf of all seven. School. Yes, yes. All right, so that had more impact than I'm, than I'm allowing. Okay, but we, I still think it was a coup. Can we turn it around for a minute, though? Because we were all just giggling about the fact that it's a New York school is what we all loved about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So at what point, can you talk a little about what the students were looking for who came here? Yeah, they were looking for the best education they right. could get in New York for the cheapest amount of money, and that the best education right. would lead them to enhance job situations. In the early days, it meant that they could teach in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, it expanded, uh, particularly as Gillisleeve did crack open uh, the medical school and the law school. Uh, a few more openings uh, that way. And, and Barnard was sending uh, uh, students down to NYU Law School before Columbia opened up. Um, and sending women to Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School before right. uh, PNS. And you had a women's law department from the early 20th century. A law department? Uh, I mean, a class, a training class for women lawyers. Inez Mill Holland was trained there. Well, oh, you're talking about where? At NYU. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no. That's NYU. what I mean. They've, yeah. They've, yeah. They not only admitted women, they made, it was a campaign yeah. to have a special course for women lawyers, yeah. and I'm, half the suffragists went there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing a count now on um, proportion of uh, Barnard graduates who worked, and you have to, you know, 15 years on, you use the registry. So, um, and you can compare it with Wellesley and, and Bryn Mawr in those places. More Barnard women worked than did those at the other schools. And even when, and, but they were married about as, they were about as likely to be married as the other schools, but that meant that a substantial portion of the married worked, and all the unmarried worked. And I think that's why they came. Well, mm -hmm. oh, no, 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 oh. no. Gildersleeve uh, had a different interpretation of it. Now, that yeah, might yeah, be why yeah, okay. Her interpretation was, 
that, uh, uh, and she wrote a beautiful essay about it, that uh, Barnard was starting to attract girls who wanted to come to college for college life and put quotes around it, and that meant girls who wanted to come to college to have a good time. Uh, and she felt that only by keeping uh, such actors on the Barnard scene would Barnard be able to compete uh, with the other sisters in the, the league. Now, whether this was a fantasy on her part, this is her as or a senior, not as a senior. So in 18, and, but she retained this interest I think as so. president. But, but she that's wanted right. college life to be uh, perpetuated. Exciting. Well, that, feel, it, that it fits was, with the, the non-urban yeah, aspect of the college, yes, right? Yeah, because yeah, that's what yes, people got look, in take, the other colleges. Take, take, yes, the year, take the yes. yearbooks, open them up that's for the photographs, right. and do you see the 116th Street subway stop? You know, no. we, we, <laughs> we make a good deal of that now. No. Some student no. going down the subway no. off to the world. Right. No or way. do you see what's the, Tennis the, uh, the cover on the, of the website where they have the photograph of downtown from the top of, of Salisbury, that's mm. an urban scene. That's right. If that's you look right. at the yearbooks, it looks like this is a, a, a garden. A suburb. A, yeah. A, a, yeah. And, and you never see the streets. Yeah. The tennis courts. But the she, tennis courts would be featured, definitely. sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I miss being in the yeah. tennis courts. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. that's, that's what, that's what they took the us to see when we came to <laughs> yeah. this college. They wait, took wait, us wait. first to the Elizabeth Arden tennis courts. Yes, this is very important. Wait, but this about the excitement, important. this is really important. Um, what I did is the, the word search through all the Barnard bulletins for suffrage, so I can track the mention on the campus about the women's suffrage movement. And Virginia is there urging students to get out and march. Oh, I'll say it. And I'm thinking, well, that's why I asked about her politics, but it also fits with what you're saying about that college should be fun and exciting, because that's the tone of it, to be part of, like Kennedy, the action and passion of your time. Well, There's a lot of um, Virginia saying in the bulletin, this is the moment, this is wow. what's going right. on, Barnard should be there, and there are Barnard contingents right. and all that. Right. Barnard, right. in, in my days of the sisterhood, and we would travel together, Barnard was always sort of separate. I could identify the alums from Barnard when we had these gatherings. I knew when someone walked in the room that this was not Mount Holyoke, mm -hmm. this was not Bryn Mawr, this no was pearls. not Smith. No, no pearls. pearls. No, I, I, could, I could really draw <laughs> pictures of each other. <laughs> but, you know, it was Barnard. It was sheer Barnard. Right. And one of the I things, when we too. talked about our colleges to counselors and to students, it was always, we have this huge campus, this beautiful yeah, campus definitely. up in New England, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. and I thought, now what can I say? We We're an urban, way. wait, no, no, <laughs> I did all that, but I said, we are unique in being on an island. <laughs> <laughs> That was yeah. 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 being part what of New York Vaughan City and, and the excitement. Oh, sure. Was, was also pushed. The Bonn and Camp. Yes, that, was, that's right. Because yes, that was, was the rural, right. you know, right. you can right. go right. away to Bonn yeah. and Camp. Yeah. And have, I would forget never oh, the person who camp. I <laughs> but, uh, the person who changes yes. this yeah. is Millicent right. Ragnar. Yes. Oh, yes. Millicent changed And she changed it in spite of that she was a Bryn Mawr person. Yeah. That she had spent about half her career at. Really right. well, which cut both ways because it was an urban school, but it was a feeder to these other. Not right. very many really kids came here then, right. um, and but she, uh, she just didn't uh, drink the Kool Aid. Mm -hmm. uh, she looked around. And she said, said, "It's New York. <laughs> this is, you know, you know, this is this is what you do. You 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 can't sell this as uh, South Hadley, Massachusetts, no, no, and you shouldn't no, sell no, it." No. And so off she goes, and that I think combined with a general change in the view of what admissions should be and shouldn't be, mm -hmm. they start focusing positively on some of these public schools, which are still in the 50s and early 60s, cranking out some you know, brilliant students, well-prepared students mm -hmm. who go off to Berkeley and off to MIT and off to Yale. And uh, in, in, I get the impression in Gildersleeve's day, uh, she just did not want to have those kids coming here. 
mm -hmm. and that she was ready to go to all sorts of lengths. To, it, foreign students, she went after foreign students, she got money for foreign students. Mm -hmm. uh, there was not much money, I think, going uh, to bringing someone from Morris High School down from the Bronx, uh, where it would have made a big, bigger difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I'm thinking about her encouraging. Remember, mo most of the people I'm thinking about are rich. They're German Jews or they're not mm -hmm. Helen Rogers Reed, for example. Um, Helen Ogden. Like, yeah, she's not Jewish. No. no, no. But I'm saying that the, the encouragement that comes from Virginia Gildersleeve mm -hmm. to those early classes in the oh, 20th she century. This specifically, yes. Yes, it's mm -hmm. very yes. much, I mean, it was really interesting to see very much, I want to know if she marched, I can't find yeah. out, because there were Barnard contingents in the suffrage parade, but she's, and I can't tell if, uh, I thought she, she said that Jane, that Charles Beard made her a socialist. Was she a socialist? No. No. Mm -hmm. right? No, she, but she, she, she was a oh, Democrat. Yeah. With a yeah, that was a kind of spongy uh, line there yeah. in 1916. Anyway, 1920. so she wants yeah. all these Barnard women to make a big showing of standing up for women's yeah. rights and going out there and, and marching. Or if she were rewriting her own story in the 30s, she wouldn't have had any problem saying she was an active suffragette. Right. Uh, I think that that would be very much part of her. She may not have done it at the time. Uh, she may have been checking with Nicholas Murray Butler. Because uh, it was her first decade. Yeah. Right. Nan Nancy, uh, Nancy, Nancy has her, Virginia sort of working the, the tubes or the valves with uh, Butler. But I, I think she was more subservient to him than, than, uh, than you per perhaps allow. Well, I find it very well, it's Rana. I mean, what I find interesting in her autobiography is the way she also kind of distances herself from the more militant, or what she calls the more militant aspects of feminism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. this is typical That's of why I'm women, trying to locate women administrators in, in mm -hmm. higher education. They're right. on, the more, on the back front, on the more conservative end of social feminism. They, yeah. Uh, are cautious yeah. uh, in, in, the, in the way you suggest. But and by militant, she a, meant, I'm sure, the Pankhursts. Probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, you know, or the yeah. American equivalents. We didn't uh, have by any. Her, by her standards. <laughs> I, I think M. Carrie Thomas at Bryn Mawr was my, uh, much more of a marcher, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, but she was much loon loonier. Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> no. Many, many That's a word to be parsed. A uh, uh, word to be. Well, it's just a, militant. It's perhaps a good so word for us to end our militant. activities <laughs> on dealing with uh, the formal Virginia. Tell us about. Virginia. Tell us more about Morningside Heights. I love this conversation. Uh, well, we're, we're about to uh, break up. I, uh, okay. The uh, the ch the couple of issues. Oh, uh, I, I mentioned the sorority thing. I think she's more. In, She's more on the fence and more inclined to think that sororities had a continuing function because they fit into this notion of socializing. Mm -hmm. And discrimination is not one of her problems. No, it's not right. problem. So yeah. if, uh, if, the, if the girls who, who commute uh, or don't have the bucks to be in a sorority or happen to be Jewish and therefore are ineligible for sorority membership because they all have these national mm -hmm. arrangements that, uh, that they adhere to, I mean, and Catholic Catholic Gamma is founded, they know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And they look around, and there may not be any, there, but there are a couple of Jewish girls in her class. See, in 1899, Virginia Gillisley should have, when she said, I'm seeing more people coming for the fun of college, she should have also seen, because they were there, the people who were coming to get a job mm -hmm. who were stretching their family resources to pay 150 bucks a year, who couldn't think of ever moving into a place like Brooks, which was the most expensive dormitory in the country when it was built. Is that right? It, the mm -hmm. most expensive. It had, it, had, it had arrangements where you had two room suites with a fireplace, and you were paying $1,100 uh, a semester for a year wow. for it, and, and there was wow. nothing at Wellesley more than five hundred dollars. It was the most expensive combination, and they couldn't fill it. And what they did was 
rent spaces over across the street where they set up cooperative dorms where the students worked, mm -hmm. you know, to clean up and that sort of stuff. Yeah. At, at rents, about a third of Brooks. In what year? Is that the beginning? In 1990? By, by 1910, yeah. Brooks is open for three years. It's yeah. still half empty as far as undergraduates are concerned. Yeah. And, and the alumni are buying up or rent, leasing apartments for students who have to live on campus because they live out in Long Island or something, mm -hmm. but they can't afford Brooks. And uh, the college isn't doing much for sure. them. Mm. This is so interesting. Well, uh, in, in March, I hope we can get you back again. And uh, Phil, who had to go off, didn't have to go off, but he was going off to the opera. Perfectly appropriate <laughs> excuse. Um, it will put something together on the sciences. Oh, really? oh, wow. Good, good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.